Hey guys, it's Mrs. Woodruff and Miss B again. We're here back for another fun video, and this time we're talking about respiratory focused assessment. Take it away, Miss B. Okay, for your respiratory focus assessment, the first thing we want to do is the interview of the patient. So you want to ask them about their history. Have they had any respiratory chronic diseases in the past or diagnosed before? For example, um, diagnose of asthma, diagnose of COPD, uh, diagnosis of a pneumonia, an infection. Maybe even they have been diagnosed of sleep apnea. Um, do they use currently a machine? So any kind of question that you want to ask them about their history, you want to ask them there and then, okay? Then you move into their actual problems right now. If they're experiencing any cough, any sore throat, any difficulty breathing, it could be at rest or with activity. And how much of an activity? Are they having difficulty breathing because they are exercising or just simply um, walking, you know, just a few feet? Uh, so we, we do want to uh, specify those questions. You also want to include, um, do they take any medications? You know, do they take an inhaler? Do they use an inhaler? Do they um, take any uh, medications that are related to their respiratory tract? Then um, don't forget to ask them about their smoking past or current smoking history. Uh, some people consider that they don't smoke because they do it once a year, but really that's considered smoking. Even if you do it once a year is still considered smoking. And you also want to specify which of the tobacco uses do they do. They do. Remember, we have smoking, uh, regular cigarettes, we have tobacco, we have chewing, it's still uh, tobacco. And vaping too. Now. Oh, vaping, yes, mm -hmm. that has vaping. been... Uh, yeah, and, and, and in the recent years, that has been very, mm -hmm. very uh, important to ask. Um, let's see, what else do we ask? We ask them about mm -hmm. how do they sleep? Do they sleep even in three pillows? Do mm -hmm. they sleep elevated in their head because they can uh, breathe uh, comfortably? So sleeping and breathing has something to do with it as well. So we always want to ask how they're sleeping, mm -hmm. uh, if they're sleep sleeping elevated. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see what else. Am I um, maybe if there's any devices they use at home, do they use inhalers? Do they have oxygen at home? Um, especially if they're on oxygen in the hospital, maybe they have a chronic respiratory disease. Like how bad are the, is their disease progressed? They need oxygen at home. Are they pretty used to oxygen? Um, and then just, I always like to kind of see that differentiation between when there's um, like, you know, how their symptoms are like, um, like, like if they're any different, because sometimes people, a lot of respiratory diseases, they kind of come up over time. So like, where are they in that, in that progression? Is this really sudden and new? Um, or is this slowly been coming up over time? Um, kind of see where they're at. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you went into it, but when we talk, ask them about like cough, we want to know about their sputum. We want to know in depth, just like we do with urine. Like, you know, is there odor to her, odor to it? Is there a different color to it? How how thick is it? Um, are they able to cough stuff up or not? Because that's a big thing. Because a lot of my um, nursing care plan is going to be related to like, okay, they have secretions. Are they getting them up? Is it productive or not? Do they need help with that? In that way that I could help them with that. And then just differentiating if they are having any sort of chest pain, if it's with their breathing or if it's not with their breathing. Because um, sometimes, you know, we're going to talk about this when we get into GI stuff, but also with cardiac stuff is when you're having chest pain, it's, you have to differentiate it. Is it a, something from my belly? something from my heart or something from my lungs. Um, so just asking kind of about what's the timing of when that chest pain is. And so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, would it be appropriate to even ask about vaccines at this time? Oh, that's a sure. great idea. I think we, it's appropriate. You can even take mm -hmm. the opportunity to say, hey, have you had your flu vaccine this year or your pneumonia vaccine? Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely um, vaccine history and assessment is appropriate when you're talking about the respiratory system. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to inspection. Yeah. You're looking at their chest. You, Ms. Dobby, would you switch? Oh, the I sure will. There you go. <laughs> you're going to pull the gown down and you're going to look at their chest, of course, pro uh, providing some privacy um, for the patients. And is it enlarged? Is mm -hmm. it uniform? Mm -hmm. um, you also want to think about where all your respiratory muscles are. Your respiratory muscles start all the way up at your nose. So you want to look for nasal flaring or any signs of that or using any neck muscles. So pretty much you're looking at your muscles. You want to see are your muscles working out or are they not? Like what kind of effort is the patient putting into their breathing? 
Yeah, exactly. Um, another thing that while, while you're looking and inspecting their chest and their effort, you can be counting their respiratory rate. So try to count the respiratory rate, not by telling the patient before, hey, I'm going to count your respiratory rate. Because when you tell them that, they will stop breathing in a, in a way, okay, and not breathe normal. So just subtle, just get your watch and start counting uh, the respiratory rate. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a couple different ways you can do the respiratory rate. You can count over 15 seconds, times it by four. You can do um, times it by two and count for 30 seconds, or you can count for a full minute. Usually I recommend the 15 seconds or the 30 seconds because they may be worried about your breathing if you're staring at their chest for that long. <laughs> yes, or they're going to look at you kind of strange. Like, why are you looking at my chest? I know. <laughs> um, okay. And then after that is... Um, yeah. So I was going to say also um, look for any devices. Like for example, this patient has a central line, anything else that could affect the respiratory system if they have chest tubes or anything else. But yeah, so I usually pull down and if it's a female patient, um, you know, I, I, I really like to see the upper chest, but um, you can also go, uh, you know, and do a little lower depending on their comfort. And you can cover one side of anything for privacy. Mm -hmm. or just pull um, everything down depending on how comfortable the patient is. Yeah. So yeah, so we have inspected, um, what do you call it? Um, there is palpation when it comes to, and can you push it back a little bit? Um, there is inspection, uh, sorry, palpation when it comes to, oh, I meant the screen, so there you go. Um, so yeah, so there is palpation that you can do and there's percussion, but we really don't do that as basic nurses. The only time I palpate with the respiratory system is if I have a patient with a chest tube, I am palpating for the snap, crackle, pop, as we call it, or the crepitus, um, the sub -Q emphysema that around a chest tube can be like escaped air if they had a collapsed lung. So that's the only time I'd really palpate. So most of my respiratory focused assessment is going to be a lot of questions, a lot of inspection, and then I'm going to listen. So I'm going to take my stethoscope. And and what I always tell students, because I know that you're going to hear different things from different instructors, to do a really basic respiratory assessment, um, uh, really what we're looking at is um, you, know, you want to listen in each lobe. And you have to think about how many lobes you have. And so on the right side of your, um, your, uh, your right lung, you have three lobes. On the left, you only have two because of the heart. Um, but I still want to listen in three places. So I want to listen up high, in the middle, and then a little lower. Um, and so... Um, your instructor may want you to listen to more places. They may also want you to like um, get to a certain part in the rib cage. I'm gonna just show you a very basic visual um, and then you can take it further if need be. Um, but yes, I'm going to get my stethoscope. I'm gonna warn them, hey, it might be a little cold. So I like to start in the uppers, kind of up here. So feel like it's usually like right below the clavicle. And um, we always wanna start on one side and kind of like with the bowel sounds, I wanna listen long enough where I can get a good measure of what's going on. And I'll talk about um, lung sounds here in a second, but the key for the assessment here is I'm gonna go one side to the other. If I went straight down on the right, I can't compare to see how they're doing in the uppers on both sides. So I'm up a little higher here, probably about like here right below the clavicle. Then I get kind of around the nipple area, maybe a little bit above. I'm listening to kind of the middle lobe. I'm going to listen on both sides. I'm going to go down a little bit lower. And I'm listening to those lower lobes. Keep in mind, as you go lower, it may be harder to hear. When it comes, I know a lot of students will ask um, patients to take a deep breath. Personally, for me, I like to see what they can do without them taking a breath. So I always have them first try. And also, by the way, you'll exhaust them if you ask them to do all these lung sounds. So I always start to see, can you hear it without them taking a deep breath? But when you get to these lowers, you may need it. So I've listened to three places in the front on both sides, going side to side. Then I'm going to take my stethoscope and I'm going to go in their armpits and I'm going on the side. Do you mind pushing the camera down so they can see? I'm kind of here on the armpit on the side. This is the lateral lung sounds. So I'm going to listen one time over here, then I'm going to go to this side and compare. So like, um, and uh, I would, uh, for posterior, um, what you can have them do, and I'll tell you as a nurse, um, I very rarely listen to posterior lung sounds. You can hear a lot better back there. So if you have someone who is very hard to hear lung sounds, it's good. Um, but you can either, when they turn and you look at their back, you can listen to them that way, or you can have them sit upright in bed if they're able to and listen. But it's the same principle, listen to three places, go from side to side, start at the top, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you have your three places. 
Um, when it comes to lung sounds, keep in mind, you know, you're either going to hear something that's clear, it just sounds like air moving, that's what you're hoping for. You may also have something that sounds wet, like so it kind of sounds like a washing machine or kind of like, um, like, like crackling. And so that's usually a sign of infection or fluid on the lungs. And then if you hear something that sounds like a, like a wheeze, um, it could be some strider or some wheezing, that's usually a problem where they have like a closed airway or they got a lot of mucus in their airway. So it's causing a whistling sound as it's um, closing and opening. And usually those are heard more upper. Um, as you go down, like I said, you might hear less sounds. It might be kind of quiet or harder to hear. Um, and that's to be expected, but that's usually a sign that you need to make sure they're getting on that incentive spirometer and taking good deep breaths. Um, if the patient is struggling to, um, you know, you're struggling to get them to take a deep breath at all, you can also give them a pillow and have them splint a little bit on their chest. Maybe they had a recent um, cardiac or uh, what do you call it, um, uh, cardiac or, you know, heart or lung procedure. And so that might be something that they're struggling with. So you can teach them to splint with that. Any additions to that, Mrs. B? I would also say taking consideration the females, uh, remember the females have the mm -hmm. breast and some females have very large breasts. So you don't want to ever auscultate on top of a breast. So mm -hmm. either politely ask them if they could hold their breast or you with the back of your hand, move it out of the way and then auscultate there. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for adding that because that's very key because I have seen a lot of students that listen on top and there's too much tissue there. You also have to consider that if you have a patient um, that is um, a little bit more obese, it may be harder because you have more tissue to go through. So you may need to ask them to take a deeper breath. Um, you know, keep in mind, like I'm showing you general spaces, but some people they're going to have EKG leads on and other things. So don't think there's some magical space. You're really just trying to say, I want to hear how they're breathing in their upper lungs, their middle lungs, their lower lungs, this, um, their lateral lungs, their back of their lungs. So it's really about the principle. So as we talk about respiratory and cardiac, you always want to think about what's the overarching principle, like what overall am I trying to, um, uh, what do you call it, listen to or get a handle on um, versus like, um, you know, being too worried about the exact space. You definitely want to be in the right area. You don't want to be all the way down here in the belly. If you're hearing gurgling, um, what do you call it, um, they either have a hiatal hernia or you're in the wrong place. <laughs> and so um, you always want to make sure that um, you're listening in the right place, but um, more it's just about the principle here. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, should it be appropriate to look at their fingernails? Oh, uh, that's that, right. At this time, since it's related that. to respiratory. Mm -hmm. So we already listened, uh, we already uh, looked for respiratory rate, but we also want to look for signs of perfusion and oxygenation. So we want to get an SpO2 monitor and see what their oxygenation is. Remember the normal for that is 95 to 100. And, and that's what you learn in nurses. Well, I'll tell you in real life above 90 is great. Um, but we're always going to, you know, check their oxygenation. And then we're going to look for other signs of poor oxygenation. So we are going to maybe look look at their fingers, grab their hand, and we're going to be looking for clubbing, which is kind of a thickness of that nail. Um, you'll start to notice that you can actually have them put their two nails together like this. And if there's clubbing, there won't be a space in between their two fingers there. Um, you can look for other signs of perfusion, like any sign of cyanosis. And when people get cyanosis, they can get it around their mouth. Um, you can sometimes, depending on the color of their skin, if they have darker skin, you may just be able to see it in their sclera or in their eyeballs. Um, what do you call it? Sometimes you have to have, look in their lip, um, you know, to, in order to see that cyanosis. Um, but you're going to be looking for signs of poor perfusion, like if their fingertips and toes are cold, or sometimes that's a sign that they're not getting as much oxygen to those part of the tissues. Would you like to add to that? I think you covered it great. Okay, so just to kind of sum up um, in this respiratory assessment video, we are effectively really focusing on uh, what do you call it, um, the functionality or how they've been functioning in the respiratory system, any history. Um, we're asking about current symptoms they may be having starting at the upper and moving down into the lower part of the airway, you know, coughing, sputum, um, difficulty breathing, chest pain, that kind of stuff. Um, we're looking then for how they're breathing. We're going to count their respiratory rate. We're looking for the use of their muscles. And one thing I think we did forget to add is that you also want to look in their abdominal muscles. So you start here at the nose, you're looking for any use of muscles. Some people, they're belly breathers. So you'll see them in like, there's it's like what we call a retraction, which is like that. It's like, it almost looks like the, um, the tissue is being sucked in because of, they're using those muscles to work really hard. But effectively there's retract, there could be retractions there, but I'm looking all throughout their chest and their abdomen for extra work. Are these muscles around my lungs having to work extra hard because I'm not breathing well? 
Um, I am um, looking for any devices or anything else, any chest tubes. If they had chest tubes, I would assess those tubes, again, starting at the patient, move, making my way out, feeling for crepitus. Um, and then I'm going to listen, and I'm listening side to side, starting in uppers, middles, and then lowers. To compare side to side, I do lateral lung sounds, and then listen to six places in the back. Um, then I'm looking for any other signs of, of like peripheral or the rest of the body. How are they oxygenating? I'm going to check their oxygen saturation as well. So yeah, did I forget anything? I think you covered it. All right. Well, and I'll let you turn it off this time. It's been a pleasure seeing you guys. Yeah, it's that one right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.